Inside the Birds is back. What's up, everyone? It is Jeff Mosher alongside Adam Kaplan for our customary midweek tape review Inside the Birds pod. Of course, we're going to review the Eagles' first win of the season, the magical win that vaulted them into first place in the NFC East. I, I chuckle at just saying that, Adam. I, I imagine you do the same thing. As someone with the Eagles who listens to our show said to me, they want us to keep picking the other <laughs> side to win uh-huh. because it's the first time we did it. And someone texted me on uh, Tuesday afternoon and said, hey, man, you and Mosher need to keep, keep picking against us. That way maybe we'll win more. And I well, thought it was funny. Yeah, good thing for them. They're playing Pittsburgh and Baltimore back to back. Yeah, right. Not right, too difficult. Right, <laughs> right, right. Well, that, they don't have to worry about that one. Uh, but but anyway, yeah. Look, it's uh, you know midweek. Um, uh, we, you know, I, the unique sh- thing about the way that Jeff and I, if you're new to our show, that we do this thing. I could just say personally for me, I get my information from tape review. I don't want to get it from the Eagles strictly. I want to get it to people who do advanced work on the Eagles because I want an unvarnished, what did this guy look like? Just because we want to learn. Not only does Jeff and I want to learn, our, my, my partner, but our, mm-hmm. our, our listeners and viewers, we do it on YouTube and we do it, it's, you know, we, we put it sound up on uh, Apple and, and for Android users. So everybody wants to know what do people around the league think? Well, you're going to get it and because this is the most notes I've had in probably a year on, on, on a game. I don't, don't ask me why. Just, just happened. <laughs> well, at least anyway. it's a win. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. But, but it really had. It, it's funny. It just so happened that um, a friend who's in scouting with another team knows I know the Eagles with all the teams I have relationships with. Mm-hmm. Said you really know the Eagles. I need your help on something, and I'll help you. Mm-hmm. So he just asked me some opinions, and then he goes, "Here's what I saw." And this guy played in the league. I'm like, "This is really helpful." I'm like, "Because I have only talked to this guy maybe twice this year." Mm-hmm. So this is good. So we're, we're ready to go here. We're ready to go. Yeah, no, and you hit it on the head just to add to that. I like to watch the tape as well. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I don't have as many guys like you who grade the Eagles tape from around the league, but what I like to do is watch. And then if I have questions, I hit up uh, some, of my, some of my sources who can answer. For example, there was a play, uh, real quick, a run play where, to me, what I was looking at, I felt like one of the linebackers um, was, was the issue. And it turns out – it was a safety who did not come up quickly enough to, to fill the run fit on that. And so that helped clear, clarify it for me. And when, that's what I think we do really well because – and fa- I think a lot of fans know this, but not everybody does. It's really hard to understand everything that goes into just one play every snap in a football game. Uh, you may think you, what you see – was the play design or how it's supposed to look, whether it worked or didn't work. And then you find out later there were some other, other elements of the play that you didn't know about. So obviously being informed is, is the best thing that you can do when you're talking about tape evaluation. So right. We've got a lot of stuff. Yeah. Right. And the thing that I love about doing the show with you, you'll pick up something that I was not aware of. You go, you actually, if it was last week's show, you, I had something wrong, which you got, you got me corrected on. And then the great thing is Jim Schwartz actually talked about it. Mm-hmm. It was like, I, and I, know I don't remember. Talking. What was it? No, I can't remember. I know you don't, you're not talking to Schwartz, but obviously someone who you talked to mm-hmm. watched the tape and caught something that we didn't have correct. And I, I don't remember because you've been really good with that. There's stuff that I don't, I'm not aware of. Mm-hmm. And you're t- whoever you're talking to, your sources, I, don't, I never ask Jeff who he talks to, just so people know. Jeff doesn't ask me. I, I don't want to know. I just, I, we just want the, we want the truth. Right. And that's why I, that, that is the whole genesis of this show is to seek the truth. It works out very well. Um, I, I, I think our, our listeners really appreciate that. Uh, by the way, before we get into the breakdown, uh, it gets better every week. The Tales from the Blind Side podcast mm. with Trey Thomas, Jamal Jackson, Todd Harriman's that's available on the Inside the Birds YouTube channel and podcast platforms is phenomenal this week. And Trey, I'll, I'll plug also, Trey did a breakdown of Jordan Maialata, uh on his own YouTube channel, which is called In, In the Trenches with Trey Thomas. I've never seen this before. He, he, he strung together every single Jordan Maialata snap. Wow. And, and went through each single wow. one. And he gave it like a plus or a minus. It's fantastic. I learned so much. Just in, and it's only about 14 I, minutes. I can't wait to watch snap, it. Snap, snap, snap. Yeah, I can't wait to watch good. it. I, one, of the, one of the advantages we have of dealing with an ex-player who's an expert at the position he played is we're giving, getting the bird's eye view of what it's like to play the position mm-hmm. and him to take you through it whether it's, it's Trey doing his show, it's on our brand or his own, 
on his own YouTube channel or our, our Sunday, our, our pregame show uh, presented by DraftKings with uh, Greg Cosell, you and I, and, and, and Trey. Trey has information and a unique insight that none of us else could, could give him, Definitely. give the Eagles listeners or anyone who's watching it for that, that matter, other than Trey. And it's just, again, one of the things that we've been blessed to have is an ex-player who knows us really knows you better. You've, know, you've, you've known Trey a while. And he's kind of fearless with his – he's willing to criticize. That, that, that's the one thing about the four of us, whether it's you, Greg, Trey, or myself, mm-hmm. we're not out there to kiss people's ass. The people right. who are watching are, are people who want to learn. And we're just so lucky to have those guys with us, and we really appreciate it. No doubt about it. And then you throw Greg Cosell in the mix on our pregame show that has been, um, from a feedback standpoint, I hope everybody's been watching because our Sunday pregame shows uh, are definitely filled with analysis and breakdown that I don't think I, – I feel like uh, NFL pregame shows, and it's been going on for a while, have become more about like, you know, like a circus atmosphere and joking around and getting into the cho- – like the, the, the war of words stuff throughout the week or who said what on Twitter – all we do is break stuff down, X's and O's, and I think it's, it's fantastic. So I hope everybody's been catching Right. It. One thing before we get started, yeah, that, that's actually – it is funny, though I will tell you, folks, if you've not seen Trey Thomas's Manscaped read, <laughs> that yeah, we do have a little fun. Weird. What's that? <laughs> we do do have a little fun. It, it, we do, and Greg Cosell's known me forever, so he picks on me, I pick on him. It'll probably get a little bit stronger coming up. Um, <laughs> we, we, we can't hint to our next Inside the – ITB TV, but it's someone who knows Greg and I very, very well. And this guy played for the Eagles, and this guy's a stud. And uh, we don't want to give it away because we haven't done the interview yet. That's right. But, uh, yeah, that, that, it, it'll, that's it'll, all it should be out. up this week. Yeah, yeah some people could probably, could probably figure it out. But anyway, it's uh, what, yet another guy we've not had on, and we've been trying to get on, and uh, the, the, we keep getting it done. So let's get started, my friend. Yeah, so let's go through the quick transactions and injuries to come out of the oh, yeah. game. yeah. Uh, I thought it was really interesting um, from an injury standpoint, Adam, what they said about Lane Johnson's ankle in that, you know, Doug Peterson explained that it's not per se that it's still injured. It's just that it takes some loosening up. And for whatever reason against the Niners, that he had to go to the sideline a couple of times, get it stretched out, get it loose. He didn't seem to have that problem, at least to my knowledge, against uh, the Bengals or, or the Rams when he made his debut. But um, so for maybe it's the temperature change. It's been a little bit cooler. That was a night game. San Francisco is also, for most people who have not been out to the Bay Area, it is not a warm place, uh, especially. It's, it's actually the warmest in the fall. Everybody says the, the, the fall is warmer than the summer, but it's not particularly hot or humid there. And so maybe for Lane, the chilliness uh, there, um, maybe it was tougher for him to get, get that ankle loose. Yeah, so in Santa Clara, where the game is, it's actually much warmer than San Francisco. You know, it's about 45 minutes away. Point. I've made that trip for, God, 17 years. But you're right. At night, it is cold. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is. But the type of surgery, which we first reported on our, our pregame show, whatever the hell that was, week one, the tightrope surgery, it's really a four to five month, four to five month, four to five week, if you have your druthers, not not to do it, not to play for four to five weeks. He played after two weeks, like like two or three weeks. Playing on it doesn't make it better. It's just going to be sore. He's just going to have to deal with it. I, I am told uh, that he actually looked pretty good for the time that he was in there, but it mm-hmm. it acted up on him. And you know, look, look as uh, Doug Peterson said, look, they had a, they they actually dressed extra guys. They dressed a lot of linemen in this game this past game. Yeah, definitely they did. Um, so wait, going back to what you said. So if it's if it's it, are you saying like the surgery itself because it's still so recent that's why it's going to be sore and he's just playing through it is I, am I I have to think at some point in a way a couple yeah. of weeks I down mean, the road it's going to strengthen up and not be sore right this yes, is not going to be but, a year but long but what okay. I'd heard is if you if you if you play it right you'd rather mm-hmm. do it at a time like Tua had it and Hurts had it at Alabama they came back within four weeks um you you'd rather. You'd rather wait four to five weeks, is the way it's explained to me by someone in the medical profession. People have come back after two weeks with it. I mean, it's crazy. Right. It doesn't mean you're, you know, it's does It's like when when we have when players have the muscle core surgery by Dr. Myers. Mm-hmm. Dr. Myers could get you back. Actually, there, I've seen players come back within four weeks. Hmm. But you don't really want to. You're pushing it. You're going to yeah. be really sore, but right. he can do it. He, it it's happened because the surgery is so good. And, and, and the technique is so good. It, 
you can do it. But getting back to lane surgery, the tightrope, you'd rather wait four weeks if you can, because it'll be to, just to stay off of, but you can't, they need them. And there's just going to be sores. That's there was, there's going to be residual soreness for a while. And that's it. I mean, you just have lane to deal Johnson's with it. tough. Yeah. yeah he, lane, he is. Lane, I mean, we've tough. said that forever. He's, he's, yeah. He wants to be there for his teammates. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, so I, I guess compared to games past and the way things have going for the Eagles, they, they're fortunate to escape this game with only two guys uh, who got hurt. Rudy Ford, who had just come back, uh, right, from an injury, leaves, yeah. it now has a groin injury. Yeah. And the bigger one to me is TJ Edwards. Uh, obviously, and I don't think he was playing great by any stretch of the means, but he hurt his hamstring. He's kind of their downhill linebacker. Doug made it seem like he's going to miss some time here. So if the Eagles are going to be in base, which against the the, the Steelers, the Steelers like to spread it out. You mentioned that. They'll never the be in day. base. Yeah, yeah. They're, yeah, they're, but, I mean, but the Steelers sure. like to run, though. I mean, they, 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 they will, but, backs. but but they are going to be three and four wide the entire game. They, they'll do some 12 mm-hmm. because they've got Ebron and Van, uh, advanced McDonald, but right. with, with, with Claypool and Deontay Johnson, who I'm a big fan of. Yeah. And Juju and Juju. And there's one other, rec- Oh, Oh, James Washington, by the way, who's good play. Yeah. Good play. They could do anything they want to the Eagles. We'll get to that on Friday, but just to give you an idea, folks, the Niners in the Niners game, you know, the Eagles had specific challenges, but it was more about Kittle. We know how that worked out. Not very well, but getting back to Edwards, mm-hmm. he, not so that he, he wouldn't come. have played a lot, right? I mean, like, because uh, he he's more did of a early. stopping linebacker. Yeah, no, he I'm did early. The Actually, game. they started with two linebackers. I believe he was in the starting unit. But he was, but well, I thought that that was matched. Like, he's their best run stopping line and, uh, right. linebacker. And the Niners like to come out in 12 personnel and run the ball. I think for the Steelers, Correct. he probably wouldn't have played that much to begin with. It probably would have been Gary and Riley in nickel for mo- And that's what it would probably be, or, I would think. Mm-hmm. Alex Singleton, we're going to get to him as we, we go over from what we've heard on the right. tape review. So, um, look, they've, they're down another linebacker. Not that it matters. None of them are starting NFL linebackers. They have what they have. Singleton right now is really, is really coming on here. Not just the pick that was thrown right to him. He's coming on. We'll, we'll get into that in a second. But the other, the other transaction, so, so we had a couple questions about this on Twitter, so I could just explain it. Why did the Eagles cut Adrian Killens? Well, number one, he was signed off the practice squad. He was not. Uh, he was not he was not elevated is the new term that we have this year, right? So you have to get him back to your practice squad. You have to cut him first. You have to waive him. So he was not claimed on Tuesday. So if they want, they'll sign him to the practice squad. Uh, as of Tuesday night or Wednesday morning, he was not yet, but I suspect that he will be. Look mm-hmm. in that game, Jeff. Nothing they did with him worked. They they did pre snap. They did um, a ghost motion with him. You know they they had they they had him go across the formation. But they didn't hand him the ball, though. You know, I thought they would do an inside handoff, do some of the chief stuff. They didn't really do much with him. Whatever they did didn't work. Right. Uh, but, you know, they tried it. And also, Burnett and Graylon Arnold, they reverted back. They were the two that went, sent, were sent back to the practice squad. Mm-hmm. And, that, that, and they protected Elijah Riley and Arnold, who were safeties. Jason Kroom was a tight end. And T.Y. McGill was a D tackle. Here's something that, uh, that I, I'm sure there's a really valid reason for it, but I can't figure it out because this is all transactional, right? Now, they've elevated Deontay Burnett twice, which means they can no longer elevate him without si- – they have to sign him, right, to the 53 yeah. if they want him to play. And they're banged up at wide receiver. Why didn't they just elevate Adrian Killens so that they didn't have to wave him after this game? Why couldn't they have just – elevated him, reverted him back to the practice squad, and signed Deontay Burnett instead because you're probably going to have to go forward with Deontay Burnett anyway. They're probably going to wind up signing him anyway. Because right now, as we speak, on the 53, you have Ortega Whiteside, who's got a calf injury, who will be very questionable this week. Greg Ward is healthy. Deshaun has got a hamstring injury, Deshaun Jackson. Uh, we'll, We'll know more this week. Alshon Jeffrey, who's not ready. He wasn't ready last week with his foot injury. So the only healthy receivers you have right now on the 53 Mm-hmm. No, you have six on it. Or Hightower, that we know of, that he's healthy. Hightower, mm-hmm. Ward, Ward, and Fulgham. They only have three healthy receivers. See, so this on is what point, I don't understand. Burnett's right, got to exactly. be on the team. <laughs> well, they probably don't want to keep seven on the 53. I, I certainly get that. Um, but here's the thing. Do you know Burnett didn't have a pass target, but guess what? 
I'm told that he actually went to Miss Burnett open for a touchdown. How about that? Oh, really? I have to see. I, I didn't see it. I'm just getting someone. Game, but I have to see. One of my trusted sources who saw it mm-hmm. saw it on uh, saw it on Monday, and I was like, "That's interesting. I didn't even notice it." So there you go. Mm. Wow. Wow. Well, uh, it's a, so they're going to have to wind up signing him, but you would think, right? I mean, they're not going to play this game on Sunday against the Steelers with just Hightower, just uh, Arthega Whiteside, and, and well, what they'll um, do, and right? Ward, right? What they'll do is they'll wait till Saturday at four p.m. Eastern. Uh, they have that's when they have until to make a decision to elevate or sign anyone off their practice. Well, they, they, the guys on their practice squad right now are Marcus Green and Burnett. Uh, Marcus Green could be elevated. Burnett would have to be signed off their practice squad. Right. Because as you said, they've used the two elevations. So it's the, we call it the roster tango, the roster gymnastics, man. It's uh, you know kind of funny the way that they're doing it, but right. we'll see what happens. All right. Um, to Sean Jackson real quick before we move on to yeah. tape, I, I think we need to wait and see if he's even at practice on Wednesday or Thursday to have a yeah. better idea of if he's going to play. Correct. Yeah. He's got the grade one hamstring strain. I was told, it up to two week injury makes him very questionable for this week. He's got to get on the field later today on Wednesday or Thursday. He's missed. He missed three straight practices. You, you can't have him miss five straight. Have him work in Friday's practice, which is less than an hour, which is very light, and think he's going to be able to play. Right. So this is what you're doing with Deshaun. It's these these these. Uh, I, I just know how much they need him. Not only is he a veteran. They need to help Zach Ertz. They need to help their their other receivers and tight ends get open. He yeah. helps. He makes such a difference and obviously help the quarterback. So they need to get him on the field. No doubt about it. All right, let's uh, get ready to kind of break down the tape before we yep. do that. I, we keep telling you about our friends at PHLSportsNation.com covering all of the Philly teams like nobody else. They, they hit you with the Sixers, the Flyers, the Eagles, the Phillies, and even the Union, uh, enhancing the fan experience with all of their great coverage and content check out their podcast as well they do a great job you can find them on twitter at phl sports nation and on the web at phl sports and we'll pause real quick for a word from our sponsor all right let's get into the eagles offense uh against the niners defense in our in our tape breakdown here and how they fared uh carson wentz now you heard me say monday adam i thought that he was um you know 20%, if you want to put a number on it, better than he was the week before and the week before that. I mean, he still obviously missed, as you mentioned, he missed Burnett. Uh, we saw that it missed Richard Rodgers with, with not a great throw and Miles Sanders coming out on the wheel. So what else do we have? Yeah, actually, okay, so here are my notes from three people. Mm-hmm. He missed throws that he shouldn't miss. For a guy as accomplished as he is, he just shouldn't have missed him. Sanders on the crosser, that's when Miles kind of punched his hand because he knew that was a big play. That might have been a touchdown. Mm-hmm. He actually missed him twice. Um, Burnett, I was told, possibly for a TD. Also missed Ertz, possibly for a TD. Hmm. Uh, the deflected pass, it was deflected. I'm not going to crush him for that. Uh, but there was another throw I was told that could have been picked off. We threw it into traffic. But he also had some good throws. This plays into what you were talking about. Mm-hmm. His feet were on, under better control. And you know what helped him? Peterson gave it out. He said he was going to do the tempo. They did it, the faster pace, and rolling him out. Where the hell's that been, Mosher? Well, no, I don't. I don't I, I it's, it's amazing. Yeah. It took like yeah. you know being o two and one to figure out that that rolling him out was a big yeah. key. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I agree with that. Um, I did notice. I thought he was more not just confident, but like mechanically sound. And look, I think it's really important. The 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 pass to Fulgham. Maybe that doesn't happen all the time, and there maybe there was a little stroke of luck in there. That was a great throw. No, the, it, the it was about was as well throw. placed as you can. Now next yeah, gen stats, yeah. next gen yeah. stats had him at only um, the separation was like point eight of a yard separation or something, mm. something crazy like that. And um, his proximity to the sideline was among the closest for catches in the NFL that week. So it, it, there wasn't a whole lot of space there, and Carson no. really, really put it in there. Yeah, that was a great – that was a terrific throw and a great catch by Fulgham. We'll get to him when we hit the receivers. But mm-hmm. I like those zone reads that they used. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you what, man. Carson, you know, he might have a little bit of hitch of a hitch from the surgery from three years ago, but mm-hmm. he's looking better and better. And there's – by the way, for the people who think there's something wrong with him physically, no, there's not. <laughs> I, I – 
because people are looking for excuses uh, with Wentz's inaccuracy at times. Look, it's been, it's been mechanics. It's nothing to do with his back or some injury. Uh, mm-hmm. He's looking. He's looking better. I mean, he, he is he as surprised he once was before the, the the knee surgery? No, I don't think so. I don't think he's far away. And look, he's this part of his game. I I it's a little bit of a gamble with him running like this, but I'll tell you what, it's certainly working. You know, it is interesting you brought that up. I've been thinking about it lately. I haven't articulated it. Um, you know, if he were hurt, I don't know if anybody that you and I know or even the coaches would be talking about it anyway, but he took so many hits against Washington that I was thinking it wouldn't surprise me if he was still – if he got something banged up and bruised that they're not really talking yeah. about because, yeah. they, I mean, he was just obliterated in that game. There was no doubt. Um, I, I mean, who would blame him if, if he had something going on from that? Hopefully it's nothing – I just remember when he had the back injury in 2018. Sure. It's 18, like yeah. nobody said anything about it until the day he had the back injury, right? I yeah, mean, no, no, like, oh, no, no about it. They, they kept it quiet. Point. And, yeah. well, what's interesting was in that, that one, I was pretty certain he had gotten hurt in the Giants game and had not been the same. But I could not get it confirmed. And then he said it. I guess he revealed it that he had a back fracture. Uh, there were rumors of it. And, you know, he admitted it. But – you would not have him running this much if he was hurt. And right. I, I do want to address one thing because we had a great question a while ago and I just, I just was not able to get to it. It was on our message board about when Carson was struggling uh, week one or two. Um, was it because he was overdeveloped because he worked out? I go, no. I, I, what, what My answer to that question, I thought it's a fair question. I think he's actually stronger physically because he needed to be. So getting to 250 pounds – at six foot five is probably a good thing. He's not over mechanical because he's, he's too developed, but getting his back stronger and getting more muscled up, I think that's actually helped him to absorb the hits that you were talking about in week one against Washington when he got sacked eight times. Yeah, and, and hit countless others. Yeah. Um, with Miles Sanders, as we move on to the running backs, are you as still as perplexed as I am on, on the explanation of not having him out on the field there and, and you know, when you're trying to run out the clock? They've got their um, packages. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was interesting because I actually thought that that's why Clement was in because he's big, he's a little bit bigger physically. He might, yeah. you know, when Corey came there, he's 230 pounds. He got himself to, when we did that, that event with him, I don't know, a year and a half, two years ago, he got himself to 217, 218 or something like that. Two, between 215 and 218. But he's yeah. a more physical running back. Okay. Yeah, he's a downhill but, guy, yeah. But, but again, when you're, you get your best players out there when you need them to be. Like, if you're going to have so, – it's one thing if they had Blunt. I would have no problem with it. What do you – I mean, this is your starting running back. I'm not – I'm not – I'm not, like, totally against the decision to put Clement in, but he's also not looked very good so far. I know he's healthy, but Clement right. has not been impressive at all. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, if Miles – you know, Sanders is your your top back and your most explosive black back, which he clearly is – then why wouldn't you want to try? He can grind out yard. He's actually a good runner up the middle. So why wouldn't you give him the ball, run it up the middle, and you know what? He might actually just shake a tackle and break one. And yeah. then you get the first down, and you got to force the other team to call a timeout. Or if they're out, mm-hmm. then there's nothing they can do. Right. The, the, the one thing we shouldn't mention with Sanders that has nothing to do with him, um, you know, he had trouble get, finding room. Don't mm-hmm. forget, they're playing with two backup guards. There are going to be times when – so both both are big guys that they're because they're just not athletic at all. Yeah, that they're not going to be able to open halls against the front. That's just this mm-hmm. was one of those games as it was explained to me. Those got both those guys had some some challenges in this game. They were they held up just okay. They didn't hurt the team, but they didn't really help the team. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, Miles, they have to they got to try some other things with Miles. Um, I know they're trying to get him. His pass targets are going up. I know they're trying. Carson's got to be more accurate. There's no question. That's obvious. The tape tells us that. But they also need to try some perimeter runs, uh, some di- different ways to take advantage of Milata's girth and, and length and strength and size and athleticism. Uh, there, there's some other things he was explaining to me that they could do to help Miles out, but this is the first game of the three that he mm. just could not get on track. I thought one thing that stood out, and I don't know if, if you um, ran this through your sources, was his blitz pickup, his pass protection, which has been in, you know improving on a weekly basis. I thought he really put it on display against San Francisco, which which on third down will come after. Uh, they came after Carson Wentz a little bit. 
And um, I thought he did a good job. There was one play where somehow there was like a, a little bit of a line game and he had to pick up a DT. And right. uh, you, don't, you, don't, you don't want Miles Sanders having to no. pick up a 320-pound DT. That's not even fair. And then that was because of miscommunication on the old line. But right. whenever they brought like, you know, a corner or a linebacker, he was, I thought he did a good job holding his own. Yeah, the issue that he had, I'm told, last year was scanning. You know, there's a, there are certain, certain rules that you have. And when you yep. scan, whatever the rules are, because he was a rookie, sometimes he didn't pick up the right guy. Mm-hmm. And that, that's typical of a rookie. But he, as you said, he's getting w- w- really much better at it. And the other thing is Boston Scott has not had the season that we expected. They, they also need to figure out how to use him because he's a talented back outside of formation, mm-hmm. so, so-called satellite back. I'd like to see them use him in the past game on screens. They're just – the screen game, Jeff, it, it just hasn't been there in two years. I, I don't know what the hell the problem is. They got to that. That it's such an important part. Of, like if you've ever watched the Chiefs or the Niners, yeah. their offense, it, it it's like that's their foundation. Is those type of plays part of their repertoire? Is a screen game, and the Eagles certainly don't have a good one right now. No, it's so sp- weird how it's sporadic. I, you know, you're right. Last year it was not there, and then all of a sudden December, when they had their nobodies on the field, all of a sudden they were able to reprise it a few times and have it work really well. But I agree with you. I think there's there's more opportunities there. Maybe again with the backup linemen that they just don't have the faith yeah. that these guys can get out into the open field and cover up, um, you know, the, the D-backs and linebackers to get spring it. But you got to try it. I mean, I think it's got to be in the, in the, in the playbook. It, yeah, and, and another – one of my favorite plays is called Smoke. It's that, um, it's that run, uh, run call that's actually a pass. Like, everyone – you line it – was, it was a big Steve Smith play with Carolina. Yep. It was the – what he's lined up right at the line. He takes one step. Yep. It's, a, it's a play it, – it's a it's – a, it's a, it's a run call that's actually to the receiver. Yeah, it's like an RPO. Eagles should, right. The Eagles should be doing that with John Hightower to get him out in space as we transition to the receivers because he's so thin. Mm-hmm. He definitely does – his contact balance right now is an issue. He's just not strong enough. This is something I was concerned about. The so-called play strength, as one source said to me, is it definitely an issue when, they, when this person watches the Eagles tape and goes, he's just not big enough. He's not going to get to where they – they need him to get to 190, 192 – next off season, but obviously he's 182, 185, somewhere in that area. He's yeah. just not strong enough. So you've got to get him out in space where he's not going to get hit. Because in training camp when he dominated, Jeff, you're, you're not hitting him. Right. You're not tackling right. him. No, no. Yeah, it's, that's it's, it's the difference. You, you always make that, that very, you know, correct analogy about AAA and the majors. You know, it's, it's, it's That's totally it. True. That's one of them. Yeah. yeah, it's one of the, you know, one of the things that you have an issue with. But, you know, he did have two catches. They're both key. Uh, but let's get to the superstar, the guy that uh, seemingly came out of nowhere. But if you listen to our show last Friday, apparently we mentioned him enough that people at least knew who they, he was. That's right. In the That's game. right. Yeah, and we also mentioned him in our pregame show at nauseum, and we gave you the scouting report from the people we've spoken with. So this Travis Fulgham's an interesting player, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, well, just think about how fortunate you were. Uh, you went to two of the training camp practices, and one, in, you, you, and this is what you talked about on the pod in the pregame show. You happen to be there where he was in the side of the field you were standing, was able to flash a little right bit. Right by me. Plays. Right by me. Yeah. And, and, I and said, you were like, hey. This kid? Yeah, exactly. I, I, you and, know, uh, I, I knew who he was. Niners were thinking the same thing that in the third quarter. <laughs> and, well, no, the funny thing was, I swear he ran a nine route. Okay, so at practice at Novacare because of COVID, uh-huh. we can't get very close to the field. Like, you're, you're, you're on the sideline, but you're very far away from the players. However, if they run a – if they run a pass route, or certainly one on ones, they're they're whizzing by you, and that's what happened. And I'm like, man, is he tall? Now I was told that I should back off that he's not fast, but he's long and he runs well enough. But he mm-hmm. uses his leverage and and length really, really well. And just to move this along here, what I saw in, in training camp was real because I'm told that he's been lighting up in practice. They thought it was time. Obviously, they, what choice do they have? They have all these injuries. And they felt like there's really nothing else he can do other than put him in a game and see, see if he could capitalize on his practices and everything he's done from day one. Now, my line source told me he did not have the urgency that you need in the National Football League to be a player. Mm-hmm. And maybe, Jeff, getting cut twice, he probably felt, okay, I'm putting words in his mouth, but I just know whenever you've lost your job or whatever, when you're not doing well, you start looking at yourself. 
because whatever he's done in Philly has worked. Well, I don't know if someone got in his ear or it's Aaron Moorhead, the receivers coach, but the kid has got it. And you don't play the way that he played. And you could, you could say, oh, it was only – he got three targets and two catches. Did you see his first catch in that route on that 15-yarder? Yeah. No, it was very impressive. Uh, he, he, and for – I can't tell if he's a big guy or not. You're saying he's a little bit tall and, and he has six, some two and a half. Him. Yeah, six, he two plays, and a half. He plays physical, so I like that. Yeah, and um, he blocked. He, he actually set a pick. There, oh, right, right, right. Yeah, he, the first person I talked to um, Monday morning – or Monday late morning – told me from the coach's tape, he set a beautiful pick, and they clearly put a bunch of them, and I don't know how many they put in the game, but they started doing that. So give the Eagles coaches credit. As much as criticism they got from us for the first three games and anyone who watched their tape, all justified because the tape told you all you need to know, mm-hmm. they actually started doing some stuff. Pre-stat motion, we mentioned the ghost motion uh, with uh, the kid Killens and whoever else they used. Okay, good. That, that, they're starting to do something. Right. Now, you could argue whether it was working or not, but at least they're doing something. Mm-hmm. And now maybe they're getting more comfortable with these young players. Yeah, and to your point on, on Fulgham about his just ability to kind of get that ball, like I, if you see, I saw a replay of the catch, the touchdown catch, where side by side you see exactly when Carson Wentz is throwing the ball and oh, what's wow. going on with Fulgham while he's doing it. Where do you see when, that? Uh, you see that? I on the internet. Where okay. I see everything. Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I got to see that. That's awesome. Go ahead. So what's really interesting is that Carson Wentz is releasing the ball at the time that Fulgham is still fighting. That corner gave some – Deontay Johnson, was it? Or Deont- yeah, Deontay. he's long, too. He's long. Yeah. He was all over Fulgham in a legal way. I'm saying he was draped on him, and Carson threw that ball knowing that, you know, it, it might be 50-50. Like, he trusted Fulgham – to make the play. Now it helps that he made, as you said, a perfect, I mean, I saw it in slow motion when, when Fulgham catches the ball, it's right in his wheel. It's in his bread basket. It's he threw with anticipation. He threw it to yeah, a spot. That's the, exactly. Kurt that Warner. Is, yeah. One thing I do want to mention on Wentz, you're seeing glimpses of the 2017 Wentz. You see four to five throws per game. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then you know, just putting a number out there. That was a Carson Wentz throw. That was mm-hmm. big time as big time gets. That was like if you're if you're in the Eagles front office, you're like holy shit, wow! <laughs> like you, you know, we all saw it. Yeah. And the funny thing is, and I'm sure all of our or a lot of our our uh, viewers think the same thing. I didn't know who the hell 13 was. I was like, who the hell is 13? I know <laughs> it's, it's not, not Nelson Aguilar. Aguilar. <laughs> right? I'm like 13. Oh, he is he wearing 13? Okay, hopefully it brings but, him good luck. But right, right. He, he, I'm told he did line up at X. Uh, he, he lined up at Rager's spot and Jeffrey's spot. And you know what? He is an X. He also will probably need to get stronger in the future. But, look, good story for the Eagles. Big, that's a big-time deal. I don't care if the Niners were without their three other top four corners. As you said, Deon, uh, Johnson was on him mm-hmm. and uh, the corner, and he, he was on him, and he still made the play. He almost didn't. I mean, he, he had to take it out of the air. That was a tough catch, but, man, that was big time. It was big time. Speaking of big time, download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app today and use code ITB for a special offer when you sign up. That's code ITB for a special offer when you sign up only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Let's uh, finish it out with the offensive line because this was uh, – Tight ends. You want to go to tight ends? I'm sorry, tight point? ends, yeah. No, you're right. I wanted to go to tight ends. Um, yeah. I thought Ertz didn't have a great game because just because the numbers say he only caught – what, four passes for nine yards? And I thought it was because they, the coverage was tight on him. But um, you mentioned Carson had a chance to hit him um, and, and miss. But, but I also had the, the intel that he, he probably didn't have his best separation game. It was Correct. not – Yeah, it, it was just not Correct. really getting open the way he normally does. Correct. It actually had very little to do, I'm told, by two sources with coverage. He just didn't win. Mm. Uh, knowing Zach Ertz like we do, he'll see the tape. He'll figure it out. And him and Justin Peel, the tight ends coach. Now, it also is some, someone told me, and this is a great point, which is probably obvious if you know football at all. But, again, I'm talking to people who played in the league, who are in scouting with other teams. And one guy pointed out to me, he goes, you know, Philly needs Deshaun Jackson or Rager on the field. They need somebody to take away the – like, when you have Deshaun Jackson, that extra safety in the box won't be there because he's going to be downfield with the corner because they're going to double – they're, the big thing this season is to take away Jackson because mm-hmm. they know the Eagles are going to take shot plays with him. 
you saw the first play w- with against the Bengals. It was double. It was double coverage. The, mm-hmm. It wasn't Wentz's fault. He just tried it. He was covered. If you put Jackson out there, the middle of the field is going to be open. It should be, and mm-hmm. uh, that's you know that that's a challenge for Zach. So they they need to get they they need if they got to put Hightower out there. Now Fulgham's going to have an X on his back now because he's he's put it together two good plays, one particular the the bomb. So they need to get Deshaun back because he is the guy who's he's a game changer and it's sooner rather than later. Yeah, and that's really ominous uh, if you think about it because I mean you could watch you could see at least that much at home that the the Niners had pretty much everybody within ten yards of the line of scrimmage, including their safeties. They had no. I, I want to say they have no respect for the Eagles deep game, but the, it's not that. It's just they didn't need to. There was no deep game other than, you know, the Rodgers pass that never was completed in the Fulgham one. So they were able to compress that field real tight, and that's why, you know, Miles Sanders really didn't have a whole lot of uh, room to run also on his runs. He didn't break anything big. That's going to be really problematic on Sunday. We'll get into that, obviously, Friday when we do our game preview pod. But, you know, the Steelers are healthy. They got all their artillery on defense, and if the Eagles don't have – um, a field stretcher, and if they've got more injuries on the offensive line, it's going to be very difficult. Somebody said to me, "Why? why well, what about John Hightower? I thought he had all that speed. And I he said, does. yes, he does, but you have to go look at the game plan. They could not, and we'll transition offensive line here, everything that Carson Wentz was asked to do was outside of the pocket. And that was not just to help Carson, but to also alleviate a patchwork offensive line because whenever Carson was in the pocket – it wasn't as, as clean as it was when it was outside the pocket. Uh, one thing I want to add on Greg Ward from the notes I was given, he does two things well, very decisive in his routes. He knows where he wants to go, and he gets there, and he he's really gets open in a short area. He's dependable, but he, he lacks run after the catch. He just doesn't have it because he he's not fast at all. He, do, he lacks one really big thing, though. He doesn't have the quickness that you want from your slot receiver, like Wes Welker, right. Julian Edelman. He just doesn't have that. And that's ultimately why they he probably won't be their long, long-term slot or whoever plays the majority of, the, of their slot. He's just not – he doesn't have that great quickness. I don't care what his time speed is. His tape speed is not good enough. That's what right. I'm told. So, well, it's pretty obvious, to yeah. Yeah. yeah, you watch good him story, on the field. But, he catches everything, but you're right. Yeah. He doesn't make anything happen after the catch, right? Yep. Right. No, there's no doubt about it. Um, offensive line, uh, look. Oh, I mean, one thing. They yeah. play, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot. This is actually really important. Uh, they played way more three receivers than I expected. Um, the Niners thought, or, the, or, the, uh, or the Eagles? No, the Eagles did. No, no, no. They came out. They, well, first of all, Fulgham played like 60% right. of the snaps. Right. Well, you remember we talked about that in the pregame Shocking. show? It's like, what are they going to do? Are they going to play more 11 and more 12? And because they're deficient in both areas. Right. If they wanted to be more 12, they didn't have Goddard. They'd have to play Richard Rodgers. Right. Sorry to cut you off, but I wanted, <laughs> no, I wanted okay. to mention that. Yeah, because th- that's really important. Because we were, we were all trying – that was really coming to the game, one of my biggest questions. And they clearly – I don't know how – well, I know how because they have the guy every day. But they clearly felt Fulgham was ready to play a lot of snaps. Mm-hmm. Maybe because he had to because they didn't have anyone. They only dressed four receivers. But that was – I mean, quite frankly, without the confidence in him, they're not. They're they're probably playing Richard Rodgers more. It's either going to be Rodgers or Fulgham playing a lot. It was. Fulgham. I give yeah, and I give Trey credit because he was the one who said he felt the Eagles would play more eleven. I'm pretty sure he said on the pregame show he did that he felt that they would play more eleven, and we all kind of looked at him and said, "Well, why would you do that? I know you you're yeah sure you're without Goddard, so twelve is difficult, but you're without Rager, you're without Deshaun, you're without Ortega Whiteside. It seemed like eleven would not be." their best modus operandi either but uh, obviously Doug wanted to get that quick hit game going he wanted a little bit more speed for the little bit of field that he was going to use and you're as you said he trusted Fulgham which is which was nice to see it's amazing yeah and by the way Rodgers only played 22 snaps so yeah they clearly played I don't have the number breakdown but they played way more 11 personnel that that was interesting I uh, you, to finish off offense that mm-hmm. that also was a uh, surprise now you want to get the O-line before we go to defense yeah, and by the way, Hightower played 50 snaps. That had to be um, a high for him. So. Wow, did he play? Yeah, he did. Yeah, 81%. Is, wow. That, 81% that was, that, of the, uh, but also, yeah. as a matter of fact, he played more snaps than any of the receivers. Ward played 48 out of – wow. Amazing. That, out of, wow. It's amazing. Fifth-round pick, rookie, played more snaps than anybody else. Unbelievable. Mm. Um, all right, so the offensive line, I mean, yeah. the, the, I mean I, I'm sure you, you've got some intel on it. My, my yeah. round the belt is I think that they held up well given the circumstance, but – I think there's a big difference in understanding that 
you know, when Carson was in the pocket, there was more duress. When he was outside the pocket, which is away from, you know, alleviating the offensive line from holding blocks, that's when they did most of, the, of their damage. So this week will be a much, much different challenge. Yeah, this is a very good game plan by, by Doug Peterson and, and uh, Press Taylor and whoever else is helping with the game plan. Really smart. You're playing with two backup guards. You're playing with a center's guy who, who – excuse me, a right tackle had surgery. Mm-hmm. A left tackle who's never started an NFL game had learned how to play football two years ago. <laughs> I mean, this is not ideal. You know, thank goodness for the Eagles there's, there were no fans in, at this game. You know, you, you, you don't have to worry about that, although in Pittsburgh they're going to have up to 6,500 fans. But, uh, look, the story obviously is Jordan Mylotta. And Mylotta, this is the way of explaining to me, on a 10-point scale, if, if he had been a veteran, you'd go, well, better than average, not, not great for a veteran. But a guy who's new mm-hmm. to the game, eight, eight and a half. Right. He never was on his back once, which is, okay, there are two ways that it was explained to me that you, for the layman to evaluate offensive line play for us who don't really understand what we're looking at sometimes. Two things. Was he on his back? Like Jason Peters was on his back way too much last season, meaning he got pushed, you know, he got, he got moved. Mm-hmm. Or – and that, in terms of balance also, how was his balance? And the big one is, how does he react from being in an awkward stance? Because when you're an offensive line with, in a three-point stance, that's not a natural stance. How does he get up? How's his athleticism? Damn good. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so here's the great thing. As one person told me from another team, and I thought this was kind of funny because I guess this, this team, are they playing the Niners? I don't know. But he, he goes, man, I – he goes, that, 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 that rugby player is better than Trent Williams in this game. I'm like, really? Yeah, yeah. it's true. Trent was, was abused. <laughs> yeah, and we'll, we'll get to that. That, that shit's really funny. Um, that was a little <laughs> shocking. Uh, but no, my lot of, let me tell you something. What he has, you can't teach. Size, athleticism, strength. Mm-hmm. He is, I, it's only one game. He, he, he's starting to understand his mean streak. You see the picture, the, the video that Brian Baldinger put on Twitter? We leveled that D lineman. He absolutely oh, yeah. obliterated that guy. It was That's awesome. impressive. I mean, he just shoves him like casually and the D lineman goes flying. Yeah, that <laughs> is exactly the way it's explained to me that he needed the urgency. He needed that mean streak, which they weren't sure he could get because he's doesn't, he's the nicest guy in the world. You know, he's such a sweetheart, you know, playing yeah. the ukulele and a singing and he's so played and, but you want it. Look, there are plenty of linemen who are great off the field, nicest guys in the world, but you they were a holes as players in a good yeah. way, yeah. and that's the part he needs. But um, the only time he actually fell, I was told that I guess an offensive lineman or was pushed into him, and he mm-hmm. fell. But that was it. None of the D linemen got to him. The issue that I I thought was the case when I watched the TV copy was exactly what happened in the game. There, I don't, I don't, no one was counting it for me, but there were some technique issue, issues which he's because he's new to football. It's hand usage. Right. Um, Punch. It's just lining Inside them up. Inside shoulder alignment. Yeah. Yes. Good point. Yeah. That was also mentioned to me. I forgot to write that down, but it was mentioned to me. Um, another. And what note, I mean by that, real quick, just so yeah, if, if a D end is going to rush to the outside, right? He he's almost like expecting the pass rusher to continue along that plane. But if the pass rusher at the last second decides, all right, I'm going to try to go inside, tra- uh, the the tackle has got to have that shoulder in the right position to be able to pivot. Yep and make that block, and there were a couple of times that he, he would be out of As position. As a matter of fact, there. on that point, as someone said to me, you got to understand, he goes, this guy says, Philly does not have athletic guards because of uh, whatever, uh, with, without Brandon Brooks and say Malo. Mm-hmm. When you're playing with not only below average guards, guys who are not really athletic, and then Herbig is playing next to um, – Mylotta, they have yeah. not played together before, so the, the right. communication, as this person said to me, clearly will be better over time, and they're going to they're gonna be challenged like no other against Pittsburgh because they're a 34 front, and they're so much better now than the Niners are because the Niners have too, much, too many injuries on defense. So, mm-hmm. But this staying in this game, it worked. And it, you're absolutely right. The game plan is phenomenal. But Peterson, he so smart, rolling Carson out. He's just – I mean, I knew this in 16, going to practices in 16. Carson was phenomenal on the run. Like, not every quarterback is good throwing on the run. He really is. He's comfortable at it. Mm-hmm. And it gives you that clear picture. You've moved away from the, from the pass rush, and you've got it. You could set your feet. You know, that, that, that's what you got to do. And I, I applaud the coaches there. 
Yeah, I was kind of surprised, by the way, that the Niners did not play more line games up front using, you know, stunts and twists. They did it yeah. a little bit. They did it on the first third down of the game, and I think they got a hurry out of it. So I was surprised they, they didn't – I mean, you've got three backups, four backups on the offensive line who are not used to communicating. So the best advantage to that is to try to get your line, you know, moving – your D-line moving around and, and making these guys think about – who they pass off and on to. And I I was just surprised that they didn't do that. Maybe that's just not part of their bread and butter. So they didn't want to start doing it now. But um, I think next week as we're coming with the Steelers, they're going to have to be ready for that. Yep. 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 You want to move to DL? Uh, Yeah. Cause you know, linebackers will save for last. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That, that, you know, it's just, yeah. uh, Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want to be as kind as I can. I mean, these people have families, but you know, it's, uh, (laughs) there's children. I mean, I mean, it, the funny thing is, before we get to, to, to the D-line, it's I, I can't even repeat some of the comments I've gotten from other teams are so nasty about the Eagles linebackers. I just feel bad for these guys. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just you kind of know, it, as you know, I've been saying, I've been on this, when are these da- damn teams going to start going after the Eagles linebackers in coverage? Mm-hmm. Well, it's happened this season because you're seeing the 15 for 15 was a good uh, Right, good right, <laughs> right. But Logan Thomas got him. Uh, yeah, the former a former quarterback in, in week one with Washington, Her, uh, Higby three times, right? You know, um, the Cincinnati tried against them; they didn't really get them that much. But this, the, 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 look, the Eagle. See, thank God the, for the Eagle fans that the Eagles' pass rush was ridiculously great in this game. Because let me tell you something: they're going to need it going against Big Ben. But this game, not only was it their best game so far this season, in the last. It was 20 or so games. I don't know if they've ever played this well. And the difference maker was number 58. No, it's not Trent Call. And it's not it, – it, you know who 58 is? Oh, I know who it is now. I mean, well, yeah, I didn't know Gennard. that Gennard Avery is 58. Because <laughs> I'll tell you what, it is not – whatever the hell he had, 19 snaps. Right. Holy shit. Wow. Shot out. You know, I know I know that it took you by surprise because I remember um who got the fourth down. Oh, the season opener, right? Remember when um Washington went for the, you know, after they took the lead, they got the ball back again. Oh, yeah. They ran a sweep to the right side on fourth and one. Uh, and they got it, and it looked like there was a guy getting, you know, blown off the block. And you're like, "There's some linebacker." I'm like, "Nope, that that was actually Jared Avery." Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> I didn't know, and and he's too small to play in base. You can't. Well, remember they ran out of linemen that game, so he had to play. But so so the the thing, it's funny. I kind of got it right and wrong at the same time. So on our previous show last Friday, mm-hmm. I said the Eagles have a the Eagles have an absolutely huge advantage on the interior. Uh, because the, they're, the the Niners, if they've won weaknesses in their interior, on their offensive right. line. But the funny thing was, and you, you alluded to it, Barnett at times dominated Trent Williams. I'm like, this is this really happening? Mm-hmm. So so I had someone sent me five minutes of clips uh, from another team, and he just said, hey, man, you're probably going to want to see this. You should talk about it, because I told the guy I'd do a podcast with you. Mm-hmm. He goes, you should probably see this stuff, because this stuff's pretty pretty interesting. Because I, I we noticed Barnett had two sacks, but the thing is, A, he was standing up, and B, you know, him being lighter, Jeff, maybe they use him as a stand-up linebacker. I know that he's not exactly ten, five yards back, but standing up, they might be onto something with him. I, they maybe, I'm sure they've used him standing up before, but nothing like this. Him uh, being I guess light- the, the issue is if he's yeah. now a stand-up rush kind of linebacker and not a guy who can play first and second down and put his sure. hand in the dirt – that's not know. what they drafted him to just be. You know, I, they drafted – he was a very good run-stopping linebacker even in, in at Tennessee. He was known yeah. for having really good fundamentals because he's not explosive, right? And right. Um, he was supposed to be able to play, you know, every down. So, I mean, you don't want to pay – you don't want to give him a contract extension now as a situational rush specialist instead of No, but of you being, know what? Uh, but if, if it – look, it's coaching. If it works, keep doing it. I, I, that's I was not expecting it. Uh, he did play 43 out of their – 62, uh, their, their uh, 73 defensive snaps. But that was, to me, it, very interesting. And the, the Jared Avery thing, they've, they've never had anyone like this. I mean, they just simply don't. Guys like Avery, you can't find. Now, I know he's short. He's only 6'1", but he is 250, 255. Mm-hmm. Trent Cole was a speed rusher, but Trent Cole was, was a little bit longer. He was explosive, but nothing like this. Now, I was told that the game against the Bengals, he didn't play well. This game, not only is his best as an Eagle, I know he had some really good games with the Browns, but nothing like this. Mm-hmm. Those four, five quarterback hits, one of them caused the interception. I got to give Matt Burke and 
Jim Schwartz credit for using this guy correctly. They, they stood him up. I know someone, I had an argument with someone I respect over the way, correct way to use him. But let me tell you something. Let, standing him up, let him use his speed like that, it worked. Bottom line, end of story. As a sub-package rusher, you can't use him a lot. Under 20 snaps is perfect. I also like the way they use Josh Sweat. You notice, Jeff, they're decreasing his snaps, which is what they need to do now that they've got five guys. And I'll tell you what, and I know Vinnie Curry's good against the run, but Vinnie Curry's going to have if, – if these guys keep bringing it, I don't know that Vinnie Curry's going to play a lot when he comes back. Yeah, we have to see. I mean, he's technically eligible to come back this week against yeah. the Steelers. Yeah. Um, last I heard, he was doing a lot better. He was doing some light – workout but um obviously we'll have to see i mean you know how it is with the hamstrings so if he's you know able to get on the practice field wednesday and thursday and do something that's more than limited then you feel yeah. optimistic sure uh, i i do think though like when you face a team like the steelers it's pretty to helpful who do run the ball uh even though they run it out of different you know multiple for- formations and and um non-base personnel you'd like to have a good run stuffer in there uh, especially when they give it to benny 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 snell being a big guy you know you want a, a good run run down type of the end. Um, but I don't know if that he's going to be ready Correct. for, for this Plus game. Plus he could play out. inside. A couple other notes here. Mm-hmm. Brandon Graham, Please. see, it's interesting. Had you, had you just gone by the statistics or you just watched TV copy, you would think he didn't play well. Well, I'm told that's not the case. Um, constant energy and chasing, run fits, edges, played well. Um, Josh Sweat. He won again in this particular role in fewer snaps with his 35-inch arms and his bend. They got they beat McGlinchey left and right. They they made Mike McGlinchey, Mike McGlinchey Penn Charter's own, look like a fifth rounder, not a first rounder. You know, Jim Schwartz has explained to me a dozen times over the last three years is not like using sub package rushers. Well, he's got one now in Avery. He hasn't used one since Chris Long, but we'll see how well Avery does against Pittsburgh this week and when they use him. But this is something that they've got now. This is what the Eagles have been waiting for when they gave up that fourth-round pick, which looked pretty bad before this week. But this is, this is what they wanted, and they got it. And I'm fascinated to see how they use him. And they're so deep now uh, with the five guys that are they're active, Sweat, Graham, Barnett, and Avery, and then they've got Two Hill, and then and, uh, Curry when he comes back. And obviously mm-hmm. Malik Jackson can play outside. They're just, if knock on wood for the Eagles' sake, if nobody gets hurt, it'll be the best D-line of football and it won't even be close. There are a mm-hmm. lot of good ones. No one, and I say no one when they're all healthy, is this deep. This is this is 2017 over again, but it's actually better in talent. Yeah, yeah well, um, I want to give Jim Schwartz a little credit on something because we've talked about, you know, pre-snap disguise and, and yeah. making the offense think. Uh, one, I saw his own blitz out there. So that was pretty good. He's yeah. done that before, just not a lot, but that's always kind of something new that you don't expect from him. Second thing I saw was a, f- he actually brought four linebackers onto the field. I, I was shocked. I did not notice this during the game. Hmm. He had a blitz put in where he had four linebackers, four D linemen and four linebackers. On Who the blitzed? Field. Do you know? Do you remember? Yes. Alex Singleton was brought in and Sean Bradley was, and this is early before the, the Edwards injury. So the four linebackers on the field, were Singleton, Edwards, Riley, and Sean Bradley. Wow. And Al- Singleton was brought in as kind of a joker blitzer. He, you know, he lined up close to the line of quickness. Yeah. And He's rushed got the passer. Good yeah, he got good shooter quickness. Um, Malik Jackson, once again, he's been their most consistent defensive tackle. He just shows up. His length and his speed. Hargrave mm-hmm. started rounding the form. This is his best game as an eagle. He looked good. He's not quite where he needs to be yet, but he's starting to get there. And – You've got the, uh, Ridgeway as their fourth tackle. Again, they're, they're eight linemen deep, man. Nobody has this depth in the, the Saturday Cup era, so this is good. And they're going to have – I'll tell you what, Jeff, they're going to have to dominate because we're not going to do the corners right now. We'll, in about five minutes, we'll probably do it, but or whatever. Mm-hmm. Their corners need help, and they need pressure, and they got to keep – I love – it's very clear to me that the players must have talked privately during the game. All right, guys, we got to bring it. Our guys need help. Because, mm-hmm. man, do they bring it in this game. Yeah, real quick with Hargrave, for the yeah. first time I saw it, I knew it was good. You know, you know, I thought that this was a really good signing, and we got intel that this this was a guy that Steelers really liked and didn't want to leave. But yep. hand usage for him, him and Malik Jackson, you know, like a guy like, like Fletch, what makes Fletch is amazing, right, is Fletch, when he's at his best, will literally pick up 
the offensive lineman who's trying to block him and displace him. him. (laughs) Right. Uh, It's just superhuman strength. I've never seen like that. But um, with Malik and Javon, they use their hands really well. They're not the biggest, strongest guys, but they're fast and they know how to use their hands. And Javon had a few interior pressures where it was that quick slap. He got by that, bop, yeah. bop, you know, using yeah. his hand yeah. usage. And I think that that's, it's a good variety to have there uh, with, with Fletch's brawn and those guys can be a little bit finesse. Uh, but I, f- I finally saw that flash from Javon. Uh, one of my favorite defensive tackles to watch for that reason is Grady Jarrett, uh, kind of an underrated yeah. guy, but he's really good. He's playing on the franchise tag. His hand usage, if you ever watch, he's so lightning off the ball, and he uses his right arm almost like a club, like an arm over move where he just swipes with that big right arm and gets inside. And I, I didn't see – it's not exactly like that with Hargrave. He's more of a slap guy, but he just – bam. I, I saw it finally, and I'm like, wow, this thing is really starting to come, come together for their D-line. You know, the Eagle, I'll give you a quick little preview for Friday's show for about five seconds. The Eagles are going to have some distinct advantages against the Steelers. And if these guys bring it, they're going to give Eagles a chance to hang in there, but they're going to have to bring it, and they're going to have to be relentless because Big Ben might not be the same quarterback he once was. His arm's still good. Uh, he, he does like the roll out of, of pressure. They've got to bring it just like they did in this game. If they do, this game could be interesting. If they don't if they don't get to Big Ben, and make it, they'll get blown out if this D-line doesn't bring it. And they're going to have to because – Let's get to the let's, – unless you have anything else, let's get to the No, the no, we can move on to the uh, the, the linebackers. Back yeah. yeah, linebackers. Yep. Um, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Hey, you know, Jim, I mean, Jim Schwartz tried to give a little cover here. He moved the goalpost. He's, right. he, he's he, right. Exactly. He's right that there are plays that, the, that we see on TV where – and I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, second play of the game for the Niners, right? Kyle yeah. Yushik lines up like a fullback. He runs up the middle almost like a pass play, and like he's blocking, but it's a pass – and he leaks out to the left side. And T.J. Edwards, that was his man. And Edwards, you know, bit on the play fake, and then he fell. So when the ball is thrown by Mullins, and it was a terrible pass, or else it would have been a really big gain, when the ball's thrown and you see Yushik there all alone, you see Nate Gary trying to recover for T.J. Edwards falling, and it looks like Nate Gary is the guy who totally blew the assignment when it's not the case. That was really right. on T.J. Edwards. Sure. Sure. But that's moving the goalposts to the fact that, that – that, that Gary is out of position plenty of times as well. I know. I, he, Jeff, he's not. <laughs> I, I don't blame. Did. I don't blame Gary. By the way, I I, don't, I, yeah. I feel like people are 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 not like Nate Gary's a fifth round pick and he used to be a safety. He's not built for what he's being asked to do. But again, it's not. But okay, you're right. But here's the issue with it: he shouldn't be out there. I mean, it's just right. It but that's is. not because he, he's not putting himself out there. The coach not his are. fault. No, no, you're right. right. It's not his yeah. fault. It's all more. It's more on the front office, and obviously, uh, not a secret. Ken Flagel act, treats him like his own son. <sighs> the problem is he doesn't have the instincts to play. He's just not a linebacker. Like, I'll I'll go old school. Do you remember Thomas Davis? He's still in the league. I think he's with Washington. Yes. Da- Thomas Davis was a safety at Georgia. He got moved because he was smaller, two twenty five, two thirty. When mm-hmm. he first came out, he's probably in the two forties now. But he got moved to. Um, linebacker with the Panthers, and he turned out to be a star. He's a great player, high character guy, great guy, awesome dude. Yeah, yeah, and it worked. Well, he had instincts to play it. Nate Gary does not, and I, I know, I know he try, he carries out what he's asked to do as best that he can. But this is what happens. I, you know, when I was laughing two or three weeks ago, and I said, "Why are teams not destroying the Eagles linebackers?" Well, they are as hell. They sure as hell are now, and. They got look, and, and Schwartz said he's true. He's right. They tried everything, every type of coverage. Mm-hmm. It didn't. It didn't matter because right. you have nobody who's instincts to cover at linebacker. Right. They just don't. Nope. Uh, other than Singleton, and- I'll tell you what he played. He played well. I know he didn't play a ton of snaps. If Alex Singleton doesn't start going forward, I don't care when Edwards comes back. Alex Singleton absolutely should be starting. I, I don't want to say who the best linebacker is. I don't think they have a best linebacker. <laughs> but th- this guy played in the CFL for goodness sake. He should be playing. Right. Right. No, I agree with you. I'll, 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 say two, I'll, I'll say two things to that, though. Yeah. One, Alex Singleton could play more, but at the end of the day, th- f- five weeks from now, we're going to be saying the same things because uh, he plays hard. Well, give but him a try. Still, Let him play at least. Right. I just think that eventually yeah. he gets the red circle around him, and then they start to see Fine, what he but does. you got to try something else. Flagel will not he, – he, he doesn't have a cha- choice now because David Allen Taylor did play in this game only on specials. Right. Get the guy out there. He played in the CFL. He actually played real football. Okay. I know it's not NFL football, but he did. He's there for a reason. 
give the guy a shot, okay? He got the job done on what they asked him to do. He, he, he carried his assignment better than any of their other linebacker. Duke Riley also not shouldn't be playing that much. They don't have anybody else. <laughs> Taylor's not ready. So that's what uh, – I. I don't need to say anything else. I mean, I really have nothing no, else that, to that, And that's it. And, and look, I mean, I understand fans. They, they're angry. They're mad. They want these guys to be better. But just remember that these guys on any other team wouldn't be put in these positions. Nate Gary should probably right. be a dime linebacker. That's it. You know, that's it. Not much more than that. A dime linebacker for anybody else. And TJ Edwards is a special teams guy. He can, he can be a downhill linebacker. Uh, maybe not even the best downhill, but an adequate one. But – the bottom line is when you're asking a fifth round pick who's a converted safety and a rookie free agent, undrafted free agent to play all these minutes for you, all these snaps, mm-hmm. I should say. And then, yeah. you know, you're bringing Alex Singleton in to be your savior. That's more on the scouting. I'm not the scout, the front office, the acquisition right. people than it is on the players. The players are what they are. Exactly. Nobody it's ever said that these guys are supposed to be good players. I agree. So, so, so very well said. Yeah. I got nothing else. Do you want to move to DBs? Yeah. D-backs. So, Darius Rod Slay. McLeod. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. McLeod played play well. Yeah, we can start at safety. He, man, they moved him way into the box in this game. Um, mm-hmm. he, he hit against the run, fit, fit well. He just did his job. Certainly in the role that he played in this game, and I'm, I'm guessing they did this because of um, uh, their, with Mills moving to a corner. I, I'm, I'm sure that's why he did it, because they didn't have that star role, whatever they call it. They have a special name for it. I, I think it's called star or something like that. Mm-hmm. But anyway, they, 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 um, they moved McLeod in there, and he did a good job. He definitely did. He had kind of a different role. I didn't, didn't know that was going to happen, but they did, and it worked. And uh, he split the time. Epps played a lot more than Wallace did, but Wallace started. What they did is they split the roles up. Uh, Wallace on early downs to not give him a lot of volume. Smart move by, coach, uh, by their coaches. And then Epps played everything else. He played maybe 18 more snaps, and they split it. At least if you're a Wallace truther, you, you got your guy on the field. Uh, they were not going to play him a ton of sacks. He's just not ready. But because Mills moved, they, they you can't ask Marcus Epps to play 100% of snaps. You just can't. That 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 not would not have been smart coaching. So right. okay, it, they got away with it. Okay, they got away with it against a beat up team. Not a great passing game. It worked. Okay, I I I applaud the coaches. They tried something different. I was told they were just okay, and that's that. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me, right, they're using Wallace when they, when they are, wanted to be a little bit more run defense-oriented, and then they used yeah. Epps when they wanted to be a little more pass defense-oriented. Which is more, obviously, in today's right. NFL. Yeah. Right, right. Although when you play the 49ers, it winds up being a little bit closer because Correct. the 49ers are in base offense so much. No, Epps but- play, yeah, Epps, because of his playing experience, he just the reason why I said what I said – when mm-hmm. the season started, all the people said Wallace would start over Epps, or it was above him, which was not – it was always Epps. That was never even questioned with anyone who works in personnel or as a coach. The outside world thought it would be Wallace. Yeah, down the line, maybe next year, but not having an offseason and a preseason eliminates these guys. They're just not right. going to have the readiness to be ready. But now that we're in week four – actually, in week five now, maybe he starts to, to work a little bit more. Maybe he starts to cut into Epps' role. He clearly did. They split the, the roles, but as you said, because – and also the Niners were behind, so they you, – you're going to have Epps on there. So uh, that was that. And then a corner, you know, other than the one bad play Mills had, I was told he held his own, did a good job, and, you know, quite frankly – They didn't test him, though. I, I mean, I felt like – That's fair. He, he yeah. did play remember, well. Remember, but... they weren't asking him because everything Kyle Shannon does is by formation. He does not any, ask anyone to win, really. He just doesn't do that. Mm-hmm. In this game coming up, if, if Mills is a corner <laughs> – See that bullseye? Put it yeah. on his back because he's gonna. He, he's the number one target. If I'm Randy Feekner, their OC, I'm going after him fifty times in this game. Yeah, you're gonna throw the ball deep on him and, and dare yep. him and, and, dare, and dare him. So I mean yep. that that will be the big story uh, for this week coming up. You know, you, you say maybe they can do this and maybe this guy can go that, and I'll just you know I'll give my my usual weekly refrain. Uh, maybe one day, one year, the Eagles will use a second or a third round pick on a linebacker or a safety. Oh, well, I guess they just did one on a linebacker, but you know, one who can, who's, who's a little bit more pro ready than, than Davion Taylor. Um, yeah. and, and also has a good projection, but I don't know. I digress. Uh, look, we tell you all the time about our friends at Manscaped, go to manscaped.com, get 20% off, uh, which is a fan and free shipping, which is an unbelievable deal that Manscaped will give you. And it's not just about, uh, you know, your lawnmower and all the tools for your family jewels. They make great stuff to get rid of your nose hair, 
your ear hair. I like all that. The, all, all the grooming that us men need. So, you know, we, we like to have fun with the, the lawnmower and Trey Thomas's reed, but, you know, some of that other stuff that they do and produce is really excellent as well and, and could be very beneficial. And if you can get 20% off and free shipping, that's something you should take advantage of right now at manscaped.com. Uh, all right, so we just broke down uh, the the offense. We gave you the defense. Just, Adam, give me your like. Um, I don't know. You know, I asked you the other day about your psyche after a win like that. If it made you feel any differently about the team, uh, you and I both feel like this matchup coming up on Sunday is is just a whole different level of readiness. And, and as far as what you're going up against, all right. So so going to the game, I, I I said I gave him a puncher's chance to win just because the Niners are beat up physically. Mm-hmm. I like what Ron Jaworski said to me on a show uh, last Wednesday for 97.5 The Fanatic. He, you know, I'd ask him, I said, Jaws, is it good getting away? And he goes, yes, absolutely. You rally together. You get away. You know, they had two bad home games. You, you get away. You, 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 you bond together. You're in the same hotel. You're flying together. And, and it worked. Uh, now, now, obviously, this game was in peril at times, but they found a way to pull it out. And, you know, I, we've always said this about Doug Peterson. The, he the players love him. They 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 play the balls to the wall for him. So, okay, so I, I that's a good thing. And they're in the NFC least. It's a, a god awful division. It's embarrassing how bad the football that these teams are. But you know what? The one difference the Eagles have between those other three teams, they've got a better coaching staff. As much as um, you know, our job is not. I think they're way better than the other teams. The Eagles. Way, oh yeah, way better. I'll take the Eagles coaching staff or Washington's, the Giants. Or Dallas any day. I'm sorry. I thought you were saying than than Pittsburgh. You're right. Over, no, no, over, not, yes. not Pittsburgh. No, yeah. but this, I, I agree. any day. And that yeah. coaching matters. It matters. They're not perfect. Our job is to criticize when warranted. We do. We we mm-hmm. we get our information from other teams, and they they tell us what it looks like, and we relay it. And it's obviously a lot of it's criticism. Um, but look, there's still a lot of these guys are left over from their their Super Bowl run. They do a good job, and they, they're veteran coaches for the most part. That's why they're able to hang in there. They know how to micromanage the, the, the players the right way to get them to, get, to do what they want. That's why against Pittsburgh going forward here, I, I give them an outside shot. I mean, look, they, they realistically will get smoked because mm-hmm. they do not match up well. They match up real well against the Niners. They do not match up well at all. Their secondary versus the, the, the Pittsburgh receiver group, oh, my God, this could be ugly. But that's why they play the games. You never know. Right. And, you know, to, just to piggyback off that before we get out of here, you know, I wrote this on InsideTheBirds.com, my story, that what they had to do against San Francisco, they needed to do to, to kind of escape with a win. And they almost didn't win the game. I mean, they took a miracle play for that to happen. <laughs> they had to get Carson out of the pocket. They yeah. had to go short. Yeah. They had to dink. They had to dunk. But the, the steal – and they could get away with it because, you know, they didn't have to worry about Bosa or D Ford and the top three corners. But – the Steelers are a different animal. They are, you know, you can try to get Carson Wentz going, dink, 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 but eventually you need to score points to beat the Steelers yep. because unlike the Niners, who were missing so much offensive artillery, the Steelers are not. And then, so, so, yeah. so we need to see Carson be able to do a, little, a lot more than he did last week. And not that they need to run the ball ton, but when they do, they need to be more successful. They really need to get Sanders going. Yeah. It's akin to the game against Buffalo at last year when it was windy as hell. And they were kind of forced to run it because of the wind. And that game was dominant for Sanders and uh, Jordan Howard. This is a game where they're they're a heavy underdog, and they should get blown out. Mm -hmm. But to give themselves a chance to win, they need all their offensive talent. Miles Sanders is an elite talent. I know he hasn't played a lot, but the kid's skill set is off the hook. Mm -hmm. He's one of the five most talented running backs in the National Football League. The kid is special. Get them special by figure. I know that they have the guards that they have. I know the offensive line's beat up and all that, but they can't use that as an excuse. Throw the kitchen sink at this defense. You, you, you gotta, you can't go in scared. Doug doesn't coach like that, but sometimes he doesn't use the weapons and the, the talent. And obviously, the quarterback's got to be more accurate and he's got to hit Miles Sanders when he's open. But mm-hmm. I throw a lot at them this game. I, I love their game plan against the Niners. I thought, they, I thought the coach did a good job. All right. Well, we will break it all down Friday morning uh, at 6 a.m. is when this that podcast will be dropped. And, uh, of course, on Sunday, starting at 10 a.m., it'll be you, me, Greg Cosell, Trey Thomas, uh, continuing to do our 
Eagles pregame live uh, show, or I can't call it the Eagles pregame live. It is the Inside the Birds yes. pregame, Inside the Birds pregame live presented by DraftKings show that uh, I look forward to doing because it's been getting better week after week. Also, remember Tales from the Blind Side with Trey Thomas, uh, Jamal Jackson, Todd Harriman's is out. It's up on our YouTube channel. It's up on our podcast platforms. And on Thursday, we'll have Grilling the Birds with Derek Gunn and Trey Thomas coming out. And that it's funny, Trey has been in so many different of our platforms, and each show has its own identity. It's completely different. It's awesome. The, the, the camaraderie awesome. he has with Gunner is fantastic, and they really break the game down from a, a whole variety of the, levels. The, so make sure you catch the that. The traffic that we're getting with Trey involved on those shows with, with D. Gunn and uh, his, his former line mates, yeah, so it, the words getting out, and we appreciate the retweets and all that. It, it, without that help, the the, the shows are not going to be as popular as they are. Right. Uh, the the um, the Todd and Jamal Jackson and Trey show is something else, man. It, it's something else. Like you'll not safe for work, up. but definitely worth the listen. <laughs> yeah, you will tear up. I don't want to give it away. I I watched uh, the show on Saturday morning or last Sunday morning when I had a little bit of time. Uh. And I love it because they don't they don't give a shit. You know, they use my foul language again. The third people no, that, that's curse. pretty apropos for the show. They will curse. They don't care. <laughs> I love it. I love fearlessness. That's so great. Love it Trey's is. awesome. He, we're learning so much. Uh, the three of you, you, me, and Cosell, and Greg. Yeah. Greg's great. He actually, Greg, you know, Greg does not defer to people much, but I love when he defers to Trey on offensive line pay, play because Trey's so smart, intuitive. Mm-hmm. It's kind of cool to see that when Greg's doing it on our show. Definitely agree. Uh, I look forward to doing the next one. Uh, and of course, Goose. If you if you you didn't know, we've got it figured out with Goose Island Brew House, where they're playing our show on the big screen, so you can come watch the show, see our show on the big screen, have a few beers, and have yourself a, a great time. So please come on out and give them a call beforehand, just to, in case you feel like you have to make a reservation. That will do it for Inside the Birds, the leading podcast in Eagles Intel. Thanks to our producer Hunter Brody. Make sure you check out his Sports Talk with Broads YouTube channel. It's phenomenal. Check him out on Twitter, at Broads81. And as always, we thank you for flying with us inside the bird.